So during our next segment, Dr. Susan Lindquist is going to talk about proteins. She's a member of the Whitehead Institute for Biomedical Research, a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator, and professor of biology at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Welcome, Dr. Susan Lindquist. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. So I'm gonna to talk to you about protein folding. And you've been hearing a few words about some proteins earlier this morning. I bet, however, an awful lot of you think of proteins naturally as, as food. Um, uh-uh. So proteins are us, basically. We do eat proteins as food, and the reason why we do that is to be able to digest those proteins into little tiny component bits so that we can string them right back up again to make our own proteins. And so how do we make our proteins, and, and what do they do? They do just about everything you can imagine. Uh, when you're looking at an apple on a tree, the light that's being reflected off that apple is being perceived by proteins in your eyes. You go to pick that apple, the muscles that uh, power that movement are all proteins. You start to eat that apple and the sensory mechanisms that allow you to taste that crisp, lush sweetness, those are all proteins. And then when you chew that apple and it gets down into your stomach and starts to be digested, all of that is being done by proteins too. So I'm gonna start out uh, by telling you how this code of life uh, it actually encodes those proteins. So we've been talking about DNA and it is, in fact, the code of life. It's a long, long, long linear string of information, and it actually works rather like a cassette tape, which is a long linear string of information, but it encodes some really complex information on it. And when you put that cassette tape into a cassette player, and you push the buttons, out comes this amazing music, a Beethoven symphony or a Stevie Nicks concert. And um, that's basically what happens when DNA code, this long linear string of information, is decoded into proteins, the proteins that will make us who we are. And those proteins are first made. They're also long linear strings of information. And they don't do anything in that shape. They have to fold into these very complex uh, structures, long linear folds, and all of those folds have to get it just right. And when they do, uh, they uh, do wonderful things for you. I want to show you a brief movie, a really brilliant movie, called The Inner Life of a Cell. I'm just going to show you a couple of snippets of it. These are proteins on the outside of the cell holding other proteins together, proteins riding through the subway system of the cell, proteins cutting other proteins apart, structural highway, the uh, cargo being delivered from one end of the cell to an, another by, a, by another protein that um, really is like the ant that's moving the rubber tree plant. <laughs> um, and those proteins have high hopes. Uh, they really can do a lot, of, a lot of great things in the cell. And I'm sorry, I've had only just a few moments to show you very little snippets of that. But um, that beautiful, beautiful movie, um, of course, has to simplify things a little bit. I've just been telling you that the proteins actually, for one thing, are not just blobs that look like that, and those are actually very accurate representations at that level of resolution. But if you really look at them in detail, they're terribly complicated, folded into very specific shapes. If you get that just a little bit wrong, disaster can ensue. For example, there's just a tiny little mistake in the folding of the protein that causes cystic fibrosis. But it's not just that if a protein fold is wrong, uh, it, the protein won't work. Sometimes if the fold is wrong, those proteins go off and do disastrous things in the cell. They can cause cancers and neurodegenerative diseases. And the reason why this is such a complicated problem is that in that movie, they took out most of the proteins so that you could see what was happening. But in reality, those proteins are packed inside that cell. They're really, it's like sardines in a can. They're just really, really packed. Except what's different, 
this beautiful illustration of David Goodsell's conveys that crowdedness, but what's not conveyed in this is the kinetic energy, the movement of those proteins, because they actually are moving around like absolute crazy. So when you think of proteins going about their business inside of a living cell, it's not like Esther Williams and her mermaids. It'd be good to have the sound come up a little bit. Thanks. Uh-uh. <laughs> no way, no how. It's, it's actually much more like the wave pool at the Summerland Amusement Park in Tokyo on a really hot summer day. That's a, a much more accurate description, uh, depiction of the life of proteins inside of a living cell. It's chaos in there. And you can just imagine that if you were to actually increase the energy of the waves, things could get bad in a hurry. Or if some of those individuals in there were handicapped and weren't working quite right, things could go bad in a hurry. And in fact, that's what all cells face. And when they're facing this problem of protein folding, this crowding and this energy does a lot of great things for biological systems. But it puts every cell and every organism on the edge of a precipice where things could go wrong in a hurry. So let me show you how one way in which this plays out in the biology of living organisms. In this experiment, we took cells and grew them at room temperature. These are yeast cells, and they form little colonies. And we grew them at room temperature, but over there we exposed those cells first to just really hot temperatures, kind of temperatures that, of water coming out of your hot water tap. And they couldn't survive it, they died. But these sort of cells over here got exposed to the same high temperature. The difference was that they'd first been exposed for about half an hour to a more moderate heat shock, 37 degrees, warm body temperature. And that 30 minutes allowed them to get ready and be prepared and able to survive that much more extreme condition which causes their proteins to start unfolding and crashing into each other. This is the same experiment with Arabidopsis, plant, mustard plant seedlings. You can do the same thing with fruit flies, with mice. Every organism on this planet, same response. It's called the heat shock response, and it protects the organisms not only from heat, but all kinds of other stresses. Now, what are they doing during that conditioning pretreatment? Well, if you look at the proteins that are being made in those cells, at the higher temperature, they're making newer proteins. So this is just a way scientists have of displaying the protein content in a side of a cell in a very simple little way. Each of those bands is a different protein. And you can see that at the lower temperatures, they're making one set of proteins. At those intermediate conditioning temperatures, they're making a whole bunch of new proteins. And those proteins are proteins that are dedicated entirely to the problem of helping other proteins to get over the problem of unfolding and, and crashing out of solution and banging into each other. And so um, that turns out to play a huge role in our biology as well. And it plays a huge role in terms of infectious disease, for example, and I won't have a time, any time to tell you about that, but you can just kind of imagine that if an infectious organism comes from a mosquito or comes from a, the soil and starts to invade your body, it faces a big change in temperature, so it really matters a lot for those organisms to be able to invade you to have that heat shock response. I am gonna tell you a little bit about how this plays out in cancer biology and neurodegenerative disease, where the proteins start uh, crashing out. So how do we look at this? Well, one thing we can do is we can take an antibody like you've been hearing about uh, with the HIV system an antibody that recognizes the master regulator of that whole response. And we can use that antibody to detect that master regulator and see if it has gone from the normal cellular outside of the environment of the cell to command central in the nucleus where all the DNA is and, and activating that response. And when it does that, we can get those cells to turn, that protein to turn brown. And as you can see over here, 
in the normal cells, that master regulator is sitting quietly out in the cytoplasm in the normal part of the cell, not doing much. But as you start moving into the cancerous tissue, now you can see that that protein is active. It's moved into the nucleus, and it's getting those cells to turn on that survival response, that heat shock survival response. So that's breast cancer. That's pancreatic cancer. That's colon cancer using that response. And that's lung cancer using that response. We've surveyed now all sorts of different cancers, and we haven't yet found one that doesn't use that response, that survival response. It's, it's very, very active in the, in the cancer cells. Now, not every, not every lung cancer, not every colon cancer, not every breast cancer, but in a very wide variety of them. So the question is then, well, some of these cancers have it and some of them don't, does it matter? So how do we look at that? Well, we've actually taken advantage of an extraordinary resource that was developed with great foresight the national, by the National Institutes of Health many years ago. Nurses, it turns out, are extremely good and reliable patients. And they were enrolled while they were still healthy in a study many, many years ago. And they agreed that if they were to get cancer, their cancers would be biopsied, they would be stored and archived for research purposes later on, and that they would um, be followed up in the clinic on a very, very regular basis over the course of many, many years. So last year, we applied to the NIH to be able to obtain some of those samples. And we stained samples that were 25 years old for that master regulator of the heat shock response and asked whether those tumors, when they were initially taken out, had a high level of that response or a low level of that response. Were they, were they using it? And then we looked at whether or not those women survived. And you can see that the, the women uh, in the black curve are uh, women who has, whose breast tumors did not have that response active. The red curve where the women are dying, that red curve actually was the curve for the, turned out when we decoded our samples to be the tumors that had a very high active heat shock response. And the blue curve is right in the middle. So it does seem to matter in the tumor Maybe the tumor is using this survival response to help them survive in environments where they should not be growing, to be doing things and taking over our bodies in ways they should not be doing, doing that. So it does seem to matter. And so is there something that we can do about it? Well, we're not really sure. We're kind of um, very much hoping that this might, for one thing, aid in diagnostics. We've done a very similar study with colon cancer and lung cancer, and we get the same results. So it might help us, and, and we're, we're doing it with uh, prostate cancer as well, so it might help us to identify those patients whose cancers are gonna have a very bad outcome, and, and, and so to know which patients should be treated more aggressively or not. We don't yet know that, but it looks like it might work. The other possibility might be if we could get Oh, find a mechanism for stopping the cancer from using that heat shock response, that survival response, maybe the cancers would start to die. And so here we've actually shown, at least in a mouse, that that seems like it might work. Because what we've done is we've taken a group of mice in which we've blocked their heat shock response or allowed it to go unchecked, and we've exposed them to a chemical carcinogen or we've given them a common human cancer mutation that's involved in lots of different kinds of cancers. And you can see that when they, the red curve, they had the heat check response active, the mice are dying, they're not surviving after many weeks. But if that heat check response has been blocked in those mice, they survive. So we're trying and we're hoping to see whether or not we might be able to find compounds that would control that response with the idea being that it might uh, improve outcomes. It's not going to cure, we don't believe, 
but we think it might make things better, it might think the rate of curing better in lots of different cancers. That's our hope. What about neurodegenerative disease? How does this protein folding problem, this thing that once seemed so abstract and distant from, from our biology, how does that play out in neurodegenerative disease? Well, these are sections of brain um, that one of the pathologists in my lab took a few years ago. And you can see for yourselves the devastation that is wrecked in the brain of an Alzheimer's disease victim. And these are uh, higher resolution autopsy sections from the brains of those individuals that have died of a variety of different neurodegenerative diseases, like Parkinson's or Huntington's or Alzheimer's. And what those arrows are pointing to are protein blobs aggregated bits of protein that have misfolded, gone off pathway, and formed little, little plaque-like bundles, bad things. <laughs> and these cause derangements in those nerve cells in the brain, these bad aggregated proteins. So it turns out, however, that these brain cells are having protein folding problems and they are not using their heat shock response. One would think, well, they, they've got proteins in trouble, they should be deploying their heat shock response, and they're not. So we are actually here, between a rock and a hard place, uh, when, <laughs> when considering this heat shock response in human health and disease. Um, cancer cells are using this survival response to kill us, basically taking advantage of it, and our nerve cells, our brains, are not using it when they should be. I mentioned that we might be able to work um, towards stopping that response in cancer. We're trying. And that, we think, has, has some uh, long-term utility because cancer treatments are, in general, of rather short duration, and most normal Nerve cells, for example, don't need the heat shock response until they get those proteins in trouble. So we think we could probably use treatments that block the heat shock response for, efficacious, um, for being efficacious against cancer. In neurodegeneration, it might be that we could turn on that heat shock response without danger. We're a little worried about the fact that if we turn that on for a very long period of time over the years and years that would be needed to combat neurodegenerative disease, it might make our brains more susceptible to cancer. So we've actually taken a different route. And to understand why in God's name we would take the route that we have taken, um, let me remind you of what I said earlier, that every organism on this planet has that same problem. We all have this problem with protein folding. And here is the tree of life. We thought, well, maybe we could take advantage of some simpler organisms to start understanding what's going wrong when those proteins are misfolding in the brain. And I also want to point out to you that if this is the tree of life, and these are the distances between organisms, that there was a lot of complicated cellular biology evolving. Lots of things like the nucleus and mitochondrial energy factories and cell cellular compartments doing all sorts of different things were evolving and evolving and evolving over eons of time before animals split off from fungi. That is, before we split off from yeast. One of the bad things about that is it makes it hard to kill fungi when they infect us because they're so much like us in terms of their cell biology. But one of the good things we thought is that they might provide a good platform for understanding these protein folding problems because they have this complex cellular architecture. So what we've been doing is been taking those proteins that misfold in a human brain. And our hope is maybe instead of, in this case, trying to do something that will activate the whole heat shock response, Maybe we can do a more surgical strike and try to figure out what those proteins are doing wrong when they start to misfold and how to stop them. Basically getting at just that beginning cellular biology. Of course, the brain is far, far more complex and there's much of it that is involved in neurodegenerative disease that we will never be able to touch with this simple organism. But if we want to understand something that I think fundamentally we need to know about 
is what's going wrong with those misfolded proteins in the first place, the very beginnings of those responses. Maybe we can use these simple organisms. So we have done that. We've taken some of these proteins that misfold in disease, put fluorescent labels on them so that we can see them, and we find that if we express them at a low level in our yeast cells, they go to the membrane and they behave themselves. And if we express them at higher levels, they start to clump and aggregate and misfold. And they do different things in those conditions. Those cells grow, those cells grow slowly, and those cells die. And it turns out that human beings that have a couple of extra copies of that protein also die of a disease known as Parkinson's disease. So this very dosage sensitive state is actually duplicated in these yeast cells. And that has meant that we've been able to uncover some of the genetics and the ways in what's happening in the cells, what's going wrong. And we've been able to use those yeast cells in screens for compounds that might make a difference. Now, the reason why we do this in a yeast cell rather than in brain cells is yeast cells are much easier and simpler and cheaper to grow. And so we've screened 150,000 compounds in my own laboratory and with the help of the NIH now, um, and that a, 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 a system that was set up that allows academic labs to access vast libraries of chemical space, we are now screening 445,000 new compounds. We just simply look for things that would make the yeast cells better. We found a few, not lots, but these cells were really sick. And many of them, those compounds correct the cellular misfolding defect, return the protein to the membrane, and they work in higher organisms with nervous systems like a nematode, and they work in rat neurons and culture. And moreover, they not only save the, the ner rat neurons from that protein misfolding, but they save those neurons from a from an environmental toxin that's known to be associated with Parkinson's disease. So we think these are some very basic uh, ways of attacking and new, unprecedented ways of attacking these kinds of problems. We think we need to attack things in new ways. We're doing the same thing with Alzheimer's now. And basically the idea is because all organisms on the planet face this particular protein folding problem, and have to deal with it, and it turns out deal with it in very, very simpler ways. We might be able to use these simpler organisms to help us devise strategies that will work on these much more complicated, beautiful organisms over here. So thank you very much for listening. This is an example of basic biology, but it, it shows you that how it might play out into translational world. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lindquist. So now you know if you're having a bad day, you can blame it all on protein folding. <laughs>